The Bible says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins against us. He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. We start a new series on Wednesday nights on missionary evangelism, primarily because we have so much, we have so much uh, personal interest in it now as a church. So I felt it would serve as well for us to do a study on it. Um, I'm going to show you something out of Galatians 3, if you turn there with me. Uh, my text is the third chapter, 16. If you have a study Bible, you see that um, they began this up in 15 and go to the end of the chapter. But I'm interested in verse 16 through 18. Um, Paul writes, now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say and to seeds as referring to many, but rather to one and to your seed, that is Christ. What I am saying is this. The law, which came 430 years later than the Abrahamic covenant, does not invalidate a covenant previously ratified by God so as to nullify the promise. That's a big deal because people are doing that today. They're bringing the law in as a source of salvation. But it just shows you how old this argument is, and it? Paul's dealing with it. For if the inheritance is based on law, that is the inheritance that comes through the seed of Christ, or the inheritance of Christ, if the inheritance is based on law, it is no longer based on a promise, because law... Promise is grace, law is works. That's Romans 4. But God has granted it to Abraham by means of a promise. And then he goes into then why the law and etc. Galatians 3 is a great, great, is, is a, has a lot to do with the argument about righteousness by grace as opposed in Christ as opposed to the law. Um, but I'm after this, I'm after what Paul explains from the Abrahamic covenant technically. In other words, he's explaining that out of the exegeting. And he says the, the, that the seed of Abraham, the seed of the Abrahamic covenant is not plural. It doesn't refer to all Jews. Uh, all of the descendants of Abraham, but rather to one, and that is to Christ. And so he makes that, so my, my, I feel like one of the key doctrines that are, that we should understand as missionary evangelists is the doctrine of the seed of Christ. How important that doctrine is. Um, we're going all the way back to Genesis 3.15 where it all began. In, in other words, we always start with the origin. You know, here's God. Okay, what, who is God? And so we go through the essence and then we show how the characteristics of God as we understand them as revealed to us, how they solve problems. How it's important to know that God is sovereign and how sovereignty works in regard to our life based on the word he gives us, the care, how the character of God works. Well, what he does is he, he goes to Abraham because the Jews, that, that they, they were always talking about, in fact, Sunday I'm going to, we're in chapter 8 of John and we're going to get into discussion. Jesus had to deal with people, religious people, that were struggling with three fathers. There is God the Father, 
and how do you be, have a personal relationship with him. There is Abraham, your father, and how you have a personal relationship with him. And there is the father of the devil and how you have a personal relationship with him. And um, John, the eighth chapter, is uh, all about that. And our truly, truly, as I say unto you. But just my point is that what the seed of Abraham, it, it comes from the seed of the woman of Genesis 3.15. Then it goes to the seed of Abraham. Then it goes to the seed of David until it becomes the seed of Mary. I mean, this is the whole progressive history of the seed of Christ. So, and why is that important? Well, it's important in the angelic conflict. If you, if you remember Genesis 3.15, hostility between the seed of the woman and the seed, right, of Satan. Uh, remember that Genesis 3.15 was pronounced, the curse was pronounced upon the serpent. Remember that? that and, but, and so I want to go back and I want to deal with the primary aspect of this concept because Paul is dealing with it in the early church. Listen, Galatians, the book of Galatians is written back. It's a doctrinal letter back to where Paul evangelistically had great ministry. And churches were established. I mean, Gal Galatia. And, uh, and they're really struggling doctrinally with some issues because the enemy comes in and sows false doctrines. We always have to be on our toes because the enemy is always sowing. Listen, he, he comes to our ground and sows, right, weeds, calls them seed. <laughs> I'd like to sow some seed. And then weeds come up, right? And say, well, look, I thought you told me this was going to be radishes. You lied to me. Duh. So let's have a word of prayer, and we'll, we'll get into this discussion tonight. I give you a moment of silence as a believer, priest, and dwelt by the Holy Spirit, the privilege to confess sin. It could be mental attitude, sin, sins, a tongue, avert sins. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness is the key to proper Bible study. I give you a moment through your priesthood to take care of that confession. If we confess that that is name, sight, whatever that is to the Father so that we can study the spiritual book under the ministry of the Holy Spirit to get spiritual revelation for our life. Father, we're thankful tonight for these who have come to study with us both by automobile and by internet. We pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of the Word of God. We're thankful that <clears throat> we are not left to our own when it comes to spiritual enlightenment, but we have the Holy Spirit, the third member of the Godhead, dwell in our life according to 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. And we can have church. We can have church as individuals. We can worship God in the truth of the word of God. And I pray this would happen to our life in such a way in Bible study that it would be carried over into our personal life, uh, into the mobile church of our life, in, in the worship, both in learning and living the word of God. For it's made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well... Here's one of the things that seems interesting to me because we find the seed of Christ that's in Genesis 3.16 is going to move all the way to the incarnation of Jesus Christ. It's going to go through covenants. There's the, the co we call this the Adamic covenant in Genesis 3.15. We call it the Abrahamic covenant in um, Genesis 12.15 and 17.22 in the book of Genesis, those chapters. We call it the Davidic covenant in 2 Samuel, the seventh chapter. Uh, and over that banner, we call that old covenant. We call that whole business old covenant. And when he comes to fulfill that word of God, right? 
I have not come to abolish the law. I've come to fulfill it. Matthew 5 and then Romans 10. Um, then we, in, we, we, are, we are brought into a new era. It's called the incarnation of Jesus Christ. The, we call it the first advent when he actually comes into the world, goes through his ministry, declares himself, and then fulfills his declaration. He declared he was the Messiah. He fulfilled all of the requirements of Messiah, plus being raised from the dead on the third day. He goes to the cross and fulfillment of it is raised on the third day. And now we're in the church age soon from that. The incarnation is, and listen, through the incarnation, cleans up the old covenant. Agreed? It fulfills it. Right? I mean, it fulfills the first advent. If the first advent is fulfilled, then the second advent is fulfilled as well. You understand that? If he's raised from the dead, we're in it. We're, we're in good shape. All right. Now, when he goes back to the Father and Pentecost comes, we're under a new covenant. In fact, at the Last Supper, he instituted, right, the new covenant. He says, we're setting on the eve of a new covenant. When you understand what my body is going to do and my blood's going to be required, then you will know we're in a new covenant. So when he goes to the cross and fulfills that, is buried and raised from the dead third day, ascends back to the Father, seated at the right hand of God the Father, we're in a new covenant day. Okay. So you see, the seed of Christ is very important to the old covenant, and it's essential to the new covenant. Agreed? So there's quite, <laughs> I just covered the whole old covenant in a flash. Now there's a lot of information in all that. But everybody who embraced, those who embraced the Adamic covenant were saved by the prophetic gospel of Christ, were missionary evangelists. That was the key. They are custodians. Listen to me now, this is important. They were custodians of the word of God in evangelism. Agreed? Everyone. Now, when it comes to Abrahamic covenant, we, we move from a Gentile dispensation to a Jewish dispensation. The same thing's required of them, isn't it? We move out of there into uh, the covenant with David. Same thing's required. All the prophets understand it. Isaiah uh, 42.6 uh, uh, Isaiah 49, 6, they, the custodians of the word of God evangelism are, be to, are supposed to be, when it came to the Jews, they were supposed to be the light to the Gentiles. In the Jewish age, like the church age, then we are the light, we are the light of Christ to the world. I mean, it's, it's always been this way. It's not. It's always been this way. The difference in it in the old covenant, you had a prophetic gospel. Christ is going to come, die on a cross. Isaiah fifty two fifty three. He's going to be buried and raised from the dead. You got this Psalms twenty two and 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 Psalms sixteen and all these things that Christ has to fulfill to be the Messiah and the Savior of the world to issue in a new covenant. And on the eve of doing that, <clears throat> he tells his disciples, it's here, right? Now, when we studied John 6, he began, to, he began telling everybody that, didn't he? You've got to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And they went, that's gross. It wasn't if you had spiritual information, it was gross if you didn't. If you took that physically, then that's, Right? That, then that's foolishness. But if you took it spiritually, then that's spiritual in, enlightenment. And so it is today. People come into Bible study, you're gonna, you're either going to, it's either going to be foolish or it's going to be spiritual enlightenment. And it depends on whether you're carnal or, or an unbeliever or whether you're saved and a spiritual person. Right? Just because you're saved don't mean you're spiritual. You got it right. You got to be filled uh, with the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Well, anyhow, um, therefore, uh, 
understanding what I just said, that all biblical history is connected to the seed of Christ. Right? I mean, you cannot study. If you study the Old Testament, that's what you're going to find. If you study the New Testament, that's what you're going to find. <laughs> right? Well, therefore, the seed of Christ, in my mind, is connected to the missionary evangelism to the world. Matthew, Matthew 28, 18 through 20, Jesus lays that argument out. Uh, a pastor one time contacted me and he said, you know, I think that was just for the Jewish age. I said, well, sure it was. I think that was for the Gentile age. I think it's for the Jewish age. I think it's for the church age. I think this is the message of the gospel that we're talking about. I think it was required of all dispensations, not just one. This is not just mine. I mean, if you study the book of Jonah, uh, if you're studying the book of Daniel with me, you'll know this. But a lot of people go like, well, I think Matthew 28 is Old Covenant, uh, and I can't argue with that. It doesn't matter to me. Doesn't matter to me. But if it does matter to you, then here's what you should do. You should go to Acts 1.8. You should go to Luke 24, 44 through 49. If Matthew 28 bothers you, these will drive you nuts. Because it's going to acquire you to be become evangelistic minded and if that bothers you then you should go to 2 Corinthians 5 17 through 21 because it says you're an ambassador for that mission now you know if you take one text maybe you've got an argument but if you put it in a greater context then what are you going to do with all these other passages well I don't think it's our responsibility to knock on my neighbor's door I don't know. It depends on whether he has an interest in spiritual things. If he does, it is your responsibility to knock on his door. How about that? Well, you think God moved you guys together? Well, anyhow, I, I you know, I'm venting a little bit, but now when you when you go back and read Galatians three sixteen through eighteen, I want you to go back and I want you to look at an outline. I put it on your paper. I want you to go back later and and look at this outline. The promises of Christ, the promise of the covenant, and the promise of the covenant inheritance. I mean, he's really pushing this idea in Matthew 3 of the, the promise versus the law, right? That's the whole third chapter. And, and if you'll go back and read that later, just take a, a good look at that from that outline and see how that works for you. Now, tonight I want to talk about four things about the seed of Christ and why it's important to missionary evangelism, why it's important and why it's been important in every dispensation and every, whether you're talking about the old covenant or the new covenant, is still the key doctrine. We are custodians of the word of God and evangelism. Now, here's the first point. The seed of Christ began with a woman in Genesis 3.15, and her name was Eve. Okay? Now, Genesis 3.15 is actually given to Satan as part of his curse. But what is described in there is the angelic conflict in a nutshell, or in one verse, right? The, the seed of the woman versus the seed of woman, which is Christ, versus the seed of Satan, which, which of course, is the angelic conflict. Now, what is interesting to me, it begins with a woman, it ends with a woman. It starts with Eve in the fall of Adam business and it's going to wind up in fulfillment with Mary in Luke 1 31 to 35 it's going to wind up with Mary it's just interesting to me that it begins with a woman ends with a woman and once I understood that it helped me understand why Jesus once he get engaged in his earthly ministry referred to his mother every time he did something that was messianic clearly messianic he always addressed her as woman. And, and, and that rang a bell with me, because that's not normal, is it? No. I mean, I, in my worst day in my relationship, my mother, I still called her mother. 
And I would have felt it was disrespectful not to do that, even I was, even though I was in great disagreement, maybe, with what was going on. I couldn't disagree. She was my mother, and I should show respect because that's the way I was raised. Now, when Jesus calls Mary woman, and he does it in some key times that is very clear to other people that this is messianic, he doesn't do disrespect. He do it, does it for spiritual enlightenment because he understands the connection of the two women. You understand that? That's really important in my opinion. During his earthly ministry, Jesus referred to Mary at his first miracle in John 2, right? Called her woman. That's a big deal. It was his first miracle to identify himself as Christ, as the seed, Christ, the seed. Then, again, probably the most famous one is when he's hanging on the cross, isn't it? He looks down at John. He looks at his mother and calls her woman, talks to John about mother, right? I mean, these are big, this is the beginning of his ministry and the end of his ministry in regard to his mother Mary. And what is he doing? He's not disrespectful. He's giving you spiritual insight. And that's how I connected these two women. That's how I connected them. Now, I'm going to show you something. I want you to go with me to Luke 1 for a moment. Luke 1. And, you know, I, I've been pressing on you how important it is not only to know the will of God, but to pay attention to the details. Are you with me? I, I am the most fortunate guy in the whole wide world to be able to teach a church that is spiritually mature. Now, we spend so much time together that we just kind of take each other for granted, you know. I never realize how good I have it until I go out to talk to somebody else. I, you know, people say, Ron, would you come and teach me? Uh, would you hold a study or do whatever, whatever? And every once in a while, uh, I'll, I'll get bold and think that would be a good idea. And I will go do that. And then I come back and I could kiss the ground on which you walk. Because it's not that they're not interested. They don't know anything compared to you. So that when you talk, you have to, you, you have to bring yourself down into a level. Sometimes I'm teaching babies. Sometimes I'm teaching immature. And listen, we all know if you teach somebody, you got to get down on their basic level, don't you? Um, in one of the church I pastored, they made the pastor visit, I've told you this, but visit Sunday schools. I, see, I have an hour off while everybody else is in class, you know, in a, in a graded Sunday school operation, which we had. And so I would wind up in all these little bitty kids things. You know, I had to go through them all. And then when I go in through them all, then I had to rotate, go back through them. That was part of my job as pastor, which, by the way, was a pretty good thing. Uh, as soon as I got where I had a little bit of authority, I changed all that. But it was really good training for me. And I remember going to a, a toddler group. And I thought, this is going to be insane. And I was all dressed up, you know, ready to go to the pulpit as soon as this hour got over. And uh, the teacher said, uh, you'll have to sit on the floor, Pastor. <laughs> sit on the floor. I went, well, all right, because I was in, under her authority. And I sat there that whole hour. Yeah, on the floor because of eye contact with the children. And you know, have you have you ever had a dog that had pups? Have you ever seen how mom lays down and the dogs waller all over her, right? 
There, that was my experience. <laughs> I, I, I mean that. I still have flashbacks. That was that was me in a toddler. As soon as I sat down, and the teacher says, "Children, this is Pastor Ron." <laughs> Holy! And they were all over me all hour. I mean, I. When I got up and walked upstairs, I, Jane said to me, what has happened to you? I mean, I look like a wreck. <laughs> my hair was all messed up. These kids were all over me. My clothes were all, you know. <laughs> Everything's an experience. And later, once I didn't have to go back, I enjoyed it. I can't tell you, I enjoyed that moment knowing that I had to go out now and pastor, pastor teach a whole bunch of adults is going to say, what happened like my wife did? She went, ah! <laughs> I went, I've been down with a group of kids sitting on the floor for an hour. <laughs> well, anyhow. It, it, so wherever you are now, I, so what I'm after in your life is for you to pay attention to the details of the will of God. When you run across the scriptures and it talks about the will of God, I want you to pay attention to them. Don't get this general concept. I want you to get detailed because you're spiritually mature enough to pay attention to what the details are because he's going to hold you accountable for details. So I want to show you one. I want to show you one. Mary didn't pay attention. I want to show you Luke 1, uh, 35. I'm just going to pick out one. Uh, Mary said to the angel in verse 35, how can this be? You know, he said, you know, you're going to have a son. He said, she says, how is it? I'm a virgin. Now watch. Watch, watch what he says. And watch the details now. Verse 35, the angel, the angel, Gabriel, answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. That's number one. Number two, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. That's number two. These are two big events for her life. And for that reason, the holy offspring shall be called the Son of God. Did you get those? That's three things. There's three things that are really important to her. Now, she didn't get it. She got the she did get the idea that I'm a virgin. How am I going to have a baby? She got that part. You know how I know she didn't get the rest of it because of Matthew. Matthew, the twelfth chapter, verse forty six and fifty. Jesus is now thirty of thirty years of age, and he is full swing in his ministry. And. They said to him in the middle of a Bible study, your mother and brothers are standing outside. They think they should get front room, they should get front row seats. Now they didn't say that, but that's why they're standing outside. And they they're not liking that, apparently. You know why I know they're not comfortable with that idea? Because they sent somebody inside to tell them. Right? All right. He says. Who is my mother and my brothers? Well, everybody looks around and goes like, bye. And then he says, whoever does the will of my father, who is in heaven, is my brother, my sister, and my mother. That's pretty powerful. That's pretty powerful. <clears throat> That's pretty powerful. Now, she got the general idea. She didn't pay attention to specifics. She wouldn't have struggled so much with what was going on. At one point, she thought maybe he was having a, a, a mental breakdown. Remember that? Everybody else was saying it. Yeah, Trump calls it the fake uh, media. 
Everybody else was saying it. So she got to thinking maybe. She not pay attention. Listen, she got the general, okay, like many of us. She missed the details, and the details is where the dynamics of the working of God is. So I'm, I'm, I'm just saying to you, you know, up to now, general view of the will of God has gotten you where you are is no longer acceptable. That's why the Father just keeps pounding this on me to pound it on you. Okay? And so what is the will of the Father? Huh? You will say, well, that's a lot. No, what's, what, yeah, but what is the will of the Father in regard to this whole thing? Listen to John 640, which we've studied. For this is the will of my Father. See, this goes along with that Matthew 12. This is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him will have, etern will have eternal life, and I myself will raise him up at the last day. Now, see, you could look at that in a very general way, or you could see the two points he made. Do you see the two points he made? Do you see him? He says, everyone who beholds and believes in him, one, will have eternal life. Two, if he has eternal life, he has rec resurrection guaranteed. I mean... See, you might say, well, the will of the Father is that for everyone to be saved. That's not what he said. That's not what he said. He said, what is important that every person believes and gets saved knows that he has eternal life because it's a gift, and he who has eternal life has a guarantee of the resurrection. I mean, none of this, none of this, I'm saved today and not tomorrow, and who knows what's going to happen and all that business. That's pretty powerful stuff. Here's a second point. The seed of Christ of the woman of Genesis 3.15 was a key doctrine to the Gentile dispensation. Just think about that. That thing carried them all the way to the flood. The understanding that tax, understanding the tax, not just the tax, but understanding the tax and the angelic conflict. Listen, the seed of Christ and the angelic conflict over the seed of Christ raged all the way. And listen, that, that civilization didn't come out too good with that message, did they? Eight people in a boat is going to start the new world. I mean... That key doctrine and the angelic conflict, these two keys were part of the Gentile dispensation from the covenant of Adam all the way to the covenant of Abraham. We've talked about that many times. Genesis 3.15 was the Lord God's judgment on Satan uh, for his role in the fall of Adamic man. It reads this way. It reads, and I will put enmity, circle that word, I put it in bold, but circle it. Between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed, he will bruise you on the head, and you will bruise him on the heel. And do you know what his true seed is? Do you know what his true seed is? Do you know the one man seed of Satan? You know what that is? The Antichrist. This is where this is all going to boil down. This whole thing is going to rage all the way to that period, all that way. It's the Antichrist versus Christ. Between your seed and her seed, he will bruise you on the head, and you will bruise him on the heel. Right there, we have the human race under Adamic sin and in need of grace salvation. Look on the second part of your paper. The word enmity. The word enmity, I guess I didn't write that down, but write this, write this Greek word down, E-C-H-T-H-R-A, E-C-H-T-H-R-A, 
Kathera is a word for enmity. In Genesis 3.15, it could be, flash over there for just a moment. Hold your place. Flash over there. I don't know where your place is, but let's go to Genesis 3.15. And this word is probably going to be, it's not going to say, it may say enmity or hostility. Genesis 3.15. Enmity. All right. It say enmity or hostility. See, they're both. And look at this. This is this. Enmity. Look, this comes out of the fall of Adam. Out of the fall of Adam on this side. On this side, and the angelic conflict on this side. Let me show it to you. Enmity is from the first Adam and will last till the second Adam. The only, well, the only way that this is dealt with in a successful way is the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel of Jesus Christ. This is why, and listen, every fallen man is in a position in Adam. Position in Adam. Corinthians 22. In, in Adam or in Christ, right? In Adam or in Christ. If you're in Adam, if your position is Adam, judicial charges of Adamic sin, Right? in that 50 things booklet. One of those, one of the 13 is enmity. You're, if you're an Adam, you're either an Adam or in Christ. If you're an Adam, you're not saved. If you're in Christ, you are saved because you believe that Christ died on the cross and was buried and raised from the dead the third day. If you're an Adam, you're under 13 judicial charges. One of those, positional, right? In Adam is a positional. If you're in Adam then you're at enmity, a position of enmity, not personal. You, you may to walk around and say you love God, but you're lost because you never believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. You're just religious. That's, it's important for you to be religious. No, it's important for you to be saved. You've got to believe that Christ died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead. That's called the gospel. You believe that, then you're saved by grace through faith, not yourself as a gift to God, not it works. <clears throat> this is the reason that evangelism is important. Everybody's, everybody in the human race is uh, in a fallen state. We're born in a fallen state. Everybody's born in Adam. You have to be born again. And this is what the angelic conflict is all about. That's Genesis 3.15. <clears throat> now, I want you to, and see, that's 1 Corinthians 15. Now, I want you to go to Ephesians, the second chapter. I want you, want you to go to Ephesians, the second chapter with me. I think I put this on your paper. Ephesians 2, 14 through 18. Now, when this chapter opens, when two opens, the first three verses we've studied in the past, talking about in Adam, you know, like Romans, like in Adam, like in Romans 5, 12 through 21, in Adam all die. Here he says, for you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked, I'm in verses 1 and 2. Uh, you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lust of the flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath. But God, being rich in his mercy because of his great love, then he goes into Jesus Christ, that whole business of Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to, I want you to drop down. Because I can't tell you how important it is 
That was verses 1 through 3. Now we're in 14 through 18. How important it is to be in Christ. All the information between verses 3 and 14 through 18 tell us how to get there. Now, when we get to 14, verse 13, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were formerly far off, were far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. See that in verse 13? See that in verse 13? See? All from verses 1 through 3, we've said, you know, so we got to get saved. Now we're in verse 13 through 18. And this is what it means to be in Christ now, right? Okay. Now, now we're in Christ Jesus. We were in Adam, now we're in Christ. He says, for he himself, or he alone, is our peace. That's peace with, peace, the peace, peace with God. He is our peace, who made both groups into one, and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall. <clears throat> by abolishing, watch this now, by abolishing in his flesh, see that's at 1 Peter 2.24, he bore our sins on his body, flesh, on the cross. Agreed? Right. Watch this now. For a, by abolishing his flesh, the what? Enmity. You understand that? Gone. Kaput. Boom. Why? When you believe the work of Christ on the cross, his death and burial, when you believe that, you are, you are baptized into Christ and in Christ all 30 judicial charges are kaput. They're gone. And he deals with enmity because it goes all the way back to the fall of Adam and the curse upon the serpent, which is Genesis 3.15. And Genesis 3.15 tells us your victory is be in the seed of the woman, which is Christ, right? There's your victory in the angelic conflict to be in Christ. There's no victory in Adam. The victory is in Christ. Agreed? I mean, that's the point of the angelic conflict. How do you win? In Christ, you win. You don't win to get in Christ. In Christ, you win. Uh, that's, that's so good. He says, by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in the ordinance, that is, that in himself he might make two into one new man, thus establishing peace. And then he goes into the doctrine of reconciliation. Because what is the answer to enmity is peace through reconciliation, which is all the work of Christ. <laughs> I mean, that's, listen, that's one of the nine factors of the Eucharist of the cup. Reconciliation, the blood of Christ. I mean, that is... I mean, why should we be evangelical? Because, listen, people are born into Adam. they got to be born again to get in Christ. Who, who has that message of grace? Us. We're the ambassadors of that message. And these people are always going to be in that position, no matter how they think they're doing. Well, I'm doing pretty good, Ron. I mean, I, I've never stolen. I've never done this. I've never done that. <laughs> yeah, well, let me tell you something. In Adam, you're under 13 judicial charges. It's got nothing to do with how you feel. <laughs> In Christ, that's your position. And the only way that can get, the only way that can get abolished is going through the gospel of Christ. And in your Christ, they're gone. Gone. For by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourself. It is a gift. Gone. Gone. Think that's not a good deal? Jeez. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Hey, I'll give you a passage you ought to read. Write this down because I don't think I put it on your paper. I'm, I want you to read Romans 5, 9 through 11. And it tells you why sometimes the word enmity is translated enemy. Well, now point three. Listen, do you see why? Listen, you know what this right here is? Look at See this gospel? See, there's the gospel. Agreed? Between Adam and Christ. Here's the, here's the gospel. This is why. 
we have to be evangelical. This is why we're ambassadors for Christ. This is why. They can't get from there to there except through there. No man. Listen, you know what this is? This in theology is called, he's the mediator between, between man and God. He's the mediator. This is, this is, this is 1 Timothy 2, 4 through 6. This is John 14, 6. No man can come to the Father except through me, right? This is why, listen, we've got the good news. You know what good news is? It's evangelism. The word evangelism is the word good news. We carry the good news. We are ambassadors of Christ with the good news. This is good. Listen, you think that's not good news? Listen, and it just gets better. The, the more you grow in the word of God, the better this looks. <laughs> the better it looks because it's, you're saved by grace. Well, point three. During the Jewish dispensation, the seed of Abraham was a key doctrine from the covenant of Abraham all the way to the incarnation of Christ. You can read about this. The seed of Christ of Abraham has now been passed. The woman's seed has been passed on to Abraham and Sarah. At Genesis 15, 4 and 5, Genesis 17, 15 and 16. I love 17, 15 and 16 when it describes this because Abraham got it in his head that he was the guy. And he's told in chapter 17, no, it, this is a deal that goes between you and Sarah. There is no deal without Sarah. Didn't you love that? And she chuckled for a lot of reasons probably. But she didn't get that news till she was 90, so I don't know how she felt about that idea. Uh, you talk about the oldest lady at the school. Uh, anybody? I mean, don't you know she got the bouquet every time? She got every award that could be given. I mean, what she in normal life, she'd be what, a great-great-grandmother? At 90, something like that? Well, tell me when you get there how many has gone down the pike. I um, guess it depends how quick your kids have kids, but anyhow. Um, in in uh, one of the great passages that's quoted by Paul is Genesis twenty two eighteen, 18. And he quotes this in Acts on your paper, Acts the third chapter, verses 24 through 26. And he, he, he's talking, uh, no, I guess that's Peter, Acts the third chapter. I guess this is Peter. Uh, and likewise, all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel, we just studied him, to his, his successors onward, the prophets, also announce these days, it is you who are the sons of the prophets and the covenant which God made with your fathers, talking about his priest nation of Israel, saying to Abraham, and in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. See, that comes out of Genesis 22, 18. You know, in that offering of Isaac, when he says all the nations shall be blessed. He, he wasn't talking about Isaac. He was talking about the seed in Isaac. See, we know that now. Um, for you first, God raised up his servant, talking to the Jew, for you first God raised up the servant and sent him to bless you by turning every one of you from your wicked ways. See, that's at John 1, 11 through 13. He came to his own. His own didn't receive him, right? So, uh, so what happens is Matthew 21. That's probably not on your paper either. But what happens is Matthew 21, 42, 43, he gives it to another. He gives it to the Gentiles who are proud to carry it. We're Gentiles and we should, be, we should, we should honor the privilege to carry this banner. It should be our privilege to carry this banner. They dropped it. They dropped the flag, man, and, and trampled on it. And God raised that up and gave it to us. I mean, God raised it up and gave it to us. I mean, whoa. Dear Father. I mean, we should take this serious. Galatians, the third chapter, 28 and 29 
I love this. This is what it means to be in Christ. Listen, it should change all your prejudices. In Christ should change all your prejudices. You still got prejudice, you need to go back to that well. You need to go back to the well. You need to do a check because listen to what he says. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. You are one in Christ Jesus. Church must carry that banner. The church must carry that banner. And when the Christian church doesn't carry that banner, whether whatever side is mucking it up, it's wrong. Right? There is neither in Christ. We are one in Christ. If you belong to Christ, then you are, then you are Abraham's descendants. If, if you belong to Christ, in Christ you have that. Your heirs according to the promise. The covenant of David brought the seed of Christ to Mary. You know how important this is? D listen to me. Details of the directive will of God. When you study Luke, the first chapter of Luke, not the, not, the, not, not, when you study the second chapter of Luke, not, not the first, but when you get to the second and we're actually going to the city of David, Bethlehem, to, have, to, to register, right, for the census, and she gives birth. She gives birth because that's where God said to give birth. She didn't do it because it was part of the direct will of God. She did it because Rome required it. Listen, God required it before Rome required it. It took, it took God set up Rome to get them there, apparently. We're, listen, we just had this enormous first chapter of Luke. We had this enormous chapter of Matthew 1 where Gabriel appears, apparently, appears to Joseph, right? These two people have had outer body experiences, right? This should have been life-changing. We're in the second chapter. They're out to lunch. You know why? Listen, it doesn't, it's not that they don't get the general idea of the will of God. They're not paying attention, and they're super grace people. We know it because Gabriel called her by a super grace title. She'd never been called this before. Highly favored of God. Not paying attention. Listen to me. I'm telling you, you got to pay attention to the details of the will of God, not just the will of God. Spiritual mature people. Now, I don't have to tell that to babies. They got, they, ah, feed me. And immature people, they're, they're, you know, they've got half their lobe is filled up with the world and the other half is filled up with the word of God. So they're all bouncing back and forth. Spiritual mature people have worked their way through all that mess. But now you've got to pay attention to the details of what he tells you because he takes this dead serious in your life. Listen, if I could tell it any way, other way that I could get around it, I'd tell you. There's no way to get around this stuff. When he says, when he says in there that she's, she's got to go to the senses because she belongs to the, uh, she belongs to the tribe of Judah. She belongs to the house of David. She belongs to the house and family of David. Ta da! That's the, that's the Davidic covenant. Ta da! I mean, as soon as she said, "I got pregnant," they should have started figure out. Well, we better get to Be we better get down to Bethlehem. It's not a very big place. We need to find a place. This baby's got to be born to Bethlehem, right? <laughs> but isn't God gracious? Sends a Roman army to get it done. Augustus. This guy wonderful. Jews, listen, the church wouldn't go out and do evangelism, so God put under Augustus, who came in and forced them to do Bethlehem, forced them, listen, did the Pax Romana so that they could go the highway and the hedges and preach the gospel of Christ throughout the Roman Empire. Tell me God's not in control. In spite of us. <laughs> okay. 
you think he then set up nations? Don't you think he set up one here that is able to go? We're prosperous enough to send missionaries around the world. Oh, gosh, I'm out of time. The seed of Mary brought it to the incarnation of Christ, and Jesus Christ, through the incarnation, brought it to the new covenant. And I've, I've given you a lot of stuff to read. So, I leave it to you to read. <laughs> Except for the last line. The very last line at the bottom of your paper. It is now our responsibility to be the custodians of the word of God and ambassadors of Christ of evangelism. Listen to me. Acts 1.8. Even to the remotest parts of the earth. And I'll tell you, the internet has really helped us because I'll tell you, we get notes from the remotest parts of the earth that get our lessons. And just think how many people are out there on, on, the, on, the, on the internet uh, with good messages too. We recently got... Um, got a note from uh, a man in Nigeria and he was thrilled he'd picked us up and so wanted to join he wanted to uh, go through the school of biblical theology so we started conversing with him and listen <laughs> I said to him I said I want you to send me all of the key people or structures, books, whatever, that has brought you to this place where you desire this in your life. Are you with me? You know, we would know half the people that he, do you know the people in this room would know half the people that he said had influenced his life for Christ? We would know them. Yeah. Yeah. Um. RB theme. <laughs> Bunch of guys that came out from under him that have had ministries over there. This guy, because he's positive, listen, God has set up a whole network of grace oriented people. Um, I mean, he knows all of them. He knows RB theme. He knows Cunningham. He knows uh, a guy uh, up in the east, McLaughlin. He's all over McLaughlin stuff. Um, he, I mean, he's got more resources than the. And I wrote him back and I said, listen, you're doing as good as that. Nothing I could have, I can't advance you farther. Listen, the key for you, you've already got the key. Just keep unlocking, doing what you're doing. These, these are all wonderful resources. All you need is the word of God. Get out there and do it. Well, I am doing as much as I can. I said, well. You don't need another statistic to put on. You don't need another reference on your paper. So we're not interested in you going through the school. You've been through the school a number of times. You understand? With all these different guys, all these different guys are all, and he's, how wonderful that was to see that all the way over in Nigeria with a guy who is positive word of God and he's got connected and one door has opened another door to feed his soul categorical Bible doctrine. And he, you know, and th then he, he gets hooked from those hookups. He get, you know, the hookup through the internet. He winds up with us and see this school by grace, but his port, your portfolio is full enough. Father, we're so thankful for your great work to open the doors where there's positive listening to the truth of the Word of God and send it all over the world, not just here. I'm so thankful, Father, for the group that you give us that are so faithful to come and study the Word of God with us. And we're, here we are in all kinds of activities, both on a 
local level and a state level and a national level and an international level because our people are more than qualified to do these great works. And you've got a whole network out there of grace-oriented people that are doing a phenomenal job to meet, this need, meet the needs of feeding the people. And I'm so thankful for that in Jesus' name. Amen. The Bible says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins against us. He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him.